Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm really, I'm the interim Dean of the Policy School, Saul Price School of Public Policy at USC. And one of the, and I say this ironically, one of the joys of being interim Dean is that uh, I get to go out of my wheelhouse a little bit and I'm a, trained as an economist and do work in health economics. And so it really gives me great pleasure to introduce today's um, speaker and conversation, conversationalist with me, uh, Joy Layden, who is the Gottesman Chair in English at Yeshiva University. Uh, Joy is a nationally recognized writer and speaker who's published 11 books, including a memoir of gen gender transition she was a National Jewish Book Award finalist for Through the Door of Life. Um, she's been featured on NPR uh, several times and her TEDx talk, Ain't I a Woman, has been viewed over 10,000 times. She's been recognized with fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, a Fulbright Scholarship, and an American Council of Learned Societies Research Fellowship. So. I'm very pleased uh, for Joy to join us today, and we're going to discuss gender identity, diversity, and how social policy responds to the cultural changes that we're seeing. So, Joy, I, I feel free to take it away, if you don't mind. Thank you, Dana. I am so glad to be here. I am going to be trying to stuff um, a seminar's worth of ideas into... Uh, a small chat. Let's see how well I do. So you won't be the first speaker to do that. So, <laughs> um, when we're trying to think our way through the institutional challenges that are raised by inclusion of trans and non-binary people, by which I just mean people who identify as something other than simply male or female, it's helpful to think of gender as a special kind of language, a shared set of signs and meanings that we use to identify ourselves and others. In our culture, the default version of this language, the one that underlies most of our personal and professional relationships is that of binary gender, which identifies everyone as either, only, and always male or female. This language is so pervasive that like, um, as Marshall McLuhan said about um, fish and water, it's, it's hard for most of us to notice it. Um, but if you want a crash course, you should watch a 60s sitcom with the sound turned off. Even if you don't know the characters, you'll immediately recognize who's male, who's female, and how the gender distinctions determine each different characters' behaviors, body language, and roles. By definition, trans and non-binary people are, uh, can't identify ourselves or be identified in the language of binary gender. That's a big problem for us, but it's also a problem for uh, most institutions that are reckoning with how to include us. Because we don't fit the binary gender language that underlies policies, forms, dress codes, and even etiquette, we can seem to short circuit that language, calling everybody's identities into question. For example, uh, when after uh, getting tenure as a man, I told my dean that I'd be returning to uh, teach as a woman. She sent me a series of emails that at first didn't have a salutation or a closing, as though now that she couldn't make sense of me in terms of the language of binary gender, she didn't know how to identify me or even how to identify herself. The dean's temporary inability to identify either of us was about more than just uncertainty about how to respond to my coming out or institutional concerns about donor and student reactions and so on. It was more even than a concern about gender. It reflected panic at the prospect of losing a shared language of identity, a fear that the biblical story of the Tower of Babel suggests is built into the foundations of human culture. And for those of you who haven't read it lately, here is a uh, somewhat excerpted version of the Tower of Babel story. Um, this is a story about the origin of what we now call diversity, an explanation for why human beings have so many language, languages 
and about how closely language is connected to a shared identity. When the story begins, uh, not that long after the flood that wiped everyone out, there's only one human language and one group of people, they all are together. The language that they share gives them shared values. It fosters unanimity in decision-making and group commitment to a single mission. They all agree to settle in the same place and they devote themselves to building a city and a tower. Um, when people, um, long for the days when everybody had the same kind of uh, cultural reference and the same education and the same canon and so forth. This is the kind of thing that they're longing for. If everybody speaks the same language and shares the same reference, we can all make decisions very easily together and have a very strong sense of, um, of shared identity of who we are. Um, but even though the settlers of Babel are about as homogenous as a society can be, in fact, there are no other people on earth other than they are to uh, challenge their, them with diversity. From the first, as you can see, they're afraid of losing their shared identity. The goal of their uh, the building project is to make a name for themselves lest they be scattered over the earth. Um, even though they've never known anything but this uh, single shared identity, they know that identity isn't an unchanging essence. They know it's not a function of blood or soil or history or common human biology. Identity is something they have to create, a name they have to make for themselves and keep on making in order to keep at bay the primal fear that human beings are so different from one another that if we don't keep building and maintaining our shared identities, we will end up scattered and alone. That of course is what happens to the settlers. Um, as a result of divine intervention, they lose their shared identity and disperse across the earth, not because God destroys their city or their tower, but because they lose the shared language that enabled them to identify themselves and one another as part of a single us. When institutions deal with people like me who can't be identified in the shared language of binary gender, it often triggers a kind of Tower of Babel panic. The fear that if trans and non-binary people are included, the shared language of binary gender will be confounded and we will no longer be able to identify ourselves and others in ways most of us count on. For schools like mine, uh, my uh, college is an Orthodox Jewish women's college, the language of binary gender isn't just a cultural default setting, it's foundational to the institution. The idea that every human being is either always and only male or female is the basis for much Orthodox Jewish doctrine, ritual, and culture. And even putting religion aside, you can't have a women's college without a way of identifying who is a woman, which is you know, the function of the language of binary gender is to identify who's a woman and who's a man. So it isn't surprising that my university had a panic reaction to my coming out after I received tenure. They put me on something they called involuntary research leave, keeping me on salary, but banning me from campus. Orthodox institutions traditionally respond to LGBTQ people by either excluding them I know several lesbians who were forced out of my college uh, after they'd been admitted as students. But what's surprising is that after a year or so, my college let me return to teaching. That represented historic progress. I'm the first and still only openly transgender employee of an Orthodox Jewish institution. But as I discovered, Letting me return to work didn't mean the university had achieved trans and non-binary inclusion. Inclusion isn't the opposite of exclusion, something that's automatically achieved when an institution lets in a kind of person it previously kept out. Rather, as this chart shows, inclusion and exclusion are both points on a spectrum of ways groups respond to people who are different um, and in, whose differences challenge the shared sense of who is us. So 
Uh, this chart has the uh, ungainly title of Spectrum of Group Responses to Identity Challenging Differences. And as you can see, um, at the uh, bottom of the list are, um, actually we've lost genocide. Genocide is the absolute bottom of the barrel response to uh, people who are different in ways that threaten group identity. And um, ethnic cleansing, not quite as bad as genocide. Um, then there's excluding people, right? There are a lot of communities, um, traditional religious communities, for example, where if somebody comes out as gay or transgender, they are uh, kicked out, they're excluded, they're excommunicated. Um, another way that uh, people, uh, groups respond to difference, this is again, a little less bad, is by shunning people who are different. You be here, but we're gonna act like you're not here. Um, moving up the scale, the next step would be something like bullying. We see that you're here and we want you to know how, um, how much we dislike you being here. So we're gonna hurt you. Um, harassment, a little better than bullying. And right about the midpoint is just ignoring difference. You just deny that it's there. You don't pay any attention to it at all. Um, after that, the scale starts moving from away from negative responses and toward more positive uh, steps toward inclusion. Um, for example, I'm going to talk about circle back to talk about tolerance. But um, for example, I've had a lot of uh, groups invite me to speak to them about trans identity. And they'll say, you know, we don't have trans members in our community, but we're interested. We're curious about this. Um, that is a step toward inclusion. Um, it obviously is an inclusion. They're saying you're not part of our group. You're different in a way that we recognize is not in our group, but we're interested. We want to find out about you. Um, there are um, a number of organizations that have policies that say that they're welcoming to people with different kinds of differences. For example, my old synagogue said that it welcomed uh, LGBTQ people. Um, and welcoming also says, we know that you're different. We think of people like you as being people outside our institution, something other than us. But we want you to know that we're, we're you're welcome to join, you're welcome to be here if you want to. You're welcome to join us, even though you're different and we're gonna keep seeing you as different. Um, one step further along is acceptance. You accept people as being different and as being part of your community. For example, uh, I have a book of poetry published uh, by a small lesbian press called Headmistress Press. Um, and I was, I think their first uh, trans member, certainly one of their few. And, you know, I'm accepted as part of the group, but it's also clear that I'm different. I'm not part one of us because I, I don't fit the idea of uh, lesbian that is the basis for the press's identity. And finally, you get inclusion. And a good example of that in relation to trans identity is um, a colleague of mine came out as trans at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And um, his dean immediately started writing to everybody at the university explaining um, uh, his gender identity, explaining how things were gonna change um, in response to it. And then they went further. So part of inclusion is you, you recognize that people are different. You change things as necessary to reflect that part of us includes people who are different. The way if you have a, somebody who suddenly loses their sight and you, you, you continue to include them, you need to get materials in Braille and do other things. Um, but also you need to value their differences for full inclusion. And this dean backed all kinds of research efforts and uh, the establishment of uh, world or renowned transgender archives at the university. Um, they value this uh, uh, teacher's 
transgender identity. It's a moneymaker. It brings in all kinds of funding and conferences and everything. That's what inclusion looks like. So when I was um, invited to come back to my university, I didn't realize this. I, I had that binary idea about, well, if I'm not being excluded, I must be included. And it took me a while to realize that they weren't including me. They were tolerating me. They were allowing me to be there, but they discouraged me and everybody else from talking about my gender or trans and non-binary identities in general. Um, this was a very conscious decision. They felt that as an Orthodox Jewish institution, they couldn't be seen as promoting or sanctioning or condoning uh, any uh, idea of gender other than the binary idea of gender. But whether it's intentional or not, that kind of don't ask, don't tell policy, you can be here as long as you don't talk about it and you don't expect us to talk about it, is a common result of tolerance. In fact, it's a sign of tolerance. Um, when we're uncomfortable talking about how somebody is different, it's suggesting that we're uh, pretending that their difference doesn't matter anymore that it's something that doesn't need to be talked about. And therefore it shouldn't be talked about. Like, why are you bringing that up? Who cares about that? Um, that doesn't matter. And when we treat things that way, we're basically treating them as being unspeakable. Um, tolerance is where institutional inclusion policies that only focus on hiring or admission tend to leave those who are seen as different. They, um, they're allowed to be there but they don't feel included. They don't, they, they don't feel understood or welcomed or valued in their difference. Uh, and like me at my college, they can often not feel seen or, or valued at all. One of the reasons that so many inclusion efforts get stuck at tolerance is because, uh, or get stuck not just at tolerance, but get stuck somewhere before inclusion is it because most of the steps that we take toward inclusion that I was just uh, describing are based on and institutionalize the idea that people we see as different are not really fully one of us. No matter how much we tolerate or are interested in or welcome or even accept their differences, they, um, they don't really fit our sense of shared identity the language that we use to understand who we are. If we wanna to get to inclusion, we need to change our language of identity, to develop one, to expand it so that it can simultaneously enable us to identify people's differences, right? If we're, if we're not acknowledging that people are different in certain ways, then we're back at the tolerance thing, don't ask, don't tell. So we need to be able to identify people as different and simultaneously identify them as us. So that being different and being us are not um, mutually exclusive options. They're part of the same thing. Um, that can be particularly challenging when it comes to trans and non-binary people, because we not only don't fit the language of binary gender, we don't even share a single language of gender among ourselves. Um, there is a constantly evolving set of terms for trans identities, um, different pronouns, and many of us use the same terms, but use them to mean really different things. Um, that is because trans identities are based on self-identification and um, as uh, uh, I'm gonna explain, self-identification is part of, of fully functional identity, but it's only part of it. Um, so as you can see, um, self-identification is one of the elements of a, a fully functional identity, how we know ourselves, that's what it means, who we know ourselves to be. The way who we know ourselves to be can be um, shifting, contradictory, idiosyncratic, um, it, it always changes over time. And it can include things for which, you know, we may know things about ourselves that we don't even have words for. That's actually the case for uh, one of the, the reasons for this sort of 
profusion of terms for trans identities is the language of binary gender identity doesn't have any words for how we understand ourselves, how we identify ourselves. And so we have to make up our own. And as once we have the freedom, the necessity and the freedom of self-identification, it turns out that there are innumerable relations to gender and identity that different people can have. I don't think we've exhausted the possibilities yet. Um, so I am free to identify myself in any way I want to. I all my life, I had a sense of female gender identification when I was growing up, even though I was growing up in a leave it to beaver world of binary gender where there was no such thing as a physically male person who had a female gender identification. But nonetheless, I was able to identify myself in any way that I wanted to. I didn't have a fully functional identity though, because for a couple of other reasons. One is other people didn't see me the way that I saw myself, not even close. I knew that nobody would see me as female, even if I told them that I was female. And I didn't have any con concept, I don't think anybody had any concept of transgender, something other than male or female. Um, another reason is that um, identities are only functional when we have socially recognized ways to express them. So for example, um, I identify as Jewish and I express that identity by doing things that other Jews recognize as things Jews do, right? I celebrate Shabbat one day a week. Um, there are people who identify as Jewish and they express that identity in ways that are completely idiosyncratic, like nobody else does them. They're deeply meaningful to them, but it's not something that other Jews share. And so that's a way that's not a part of their fully functional Jewish identity. Um, trans people don't really have socially recognized ways to express our self-identifications. We have some more options than we used to. Um, there are forms which allow us to check transgender or there's a space for other when we're um, identifying ourselves in terms of gender, for example. Um, but there really are not very many conventions or roles that are um, available to express any of this many different kinds of trans identities. Whereas if you think about it, there are many, many, many ways to express your sense of being a man or a woman, innumerable ways. However, as you can see, the part of the chart where all of these circles overlap and um, it's uh, visually helpful that, that that part is white, it makes it stand out, but I don't mean to associate this with uh, whiteness in any way, it's not a racial thing. Um, but when all of these things overlap, when the way you identify yourself is a way that other people identify you and which you have socially recognized ways to express, you have a fully functional social identity. However, as you can see, that is always uh, only a part of the story. For all of us, there are ways that we know ourselves to be, that we identify ourselves, that other people don't identify our, our, us, either because we haven't talked to them about it or we don't know how to or we don't want to, but they're, they're private. They may be very important, but it's not how we are identified by others. So, um, we are all also identified by others in ways that don't fit our identifications of ourselves. For example, um, one of the problems that parents have with young children is young children identify us only as parents. They don't identify us as people who have needs of our own, right? So our self-identification, who we know ourselves to be, never fits completely the way we're identified by our small children or maybe any children, I'm not positive about that. Uh, with my kids, it's a work in progress. Um, and by the same token, there are uh, socially recognized ways to express our identities that should say identities 
Some of those ways fit who we know ourselves to be, and some of them don't. Some of them fit the way other people see us, and some of them don't. Sometimes we express our identities in ways that don't fit how other people see us. Um, that's the way a lot of people experienced me when I went back to teaching at Stern, where I was expressing my female gender identification, um, but it was not fitting the way other people saw me. So um, this chart, I hope, helps us articulate what the settlers of Babel understood, that no matter what shared identities we create, we're all so different and so changeable that no one identity is gonna perfectly or permanently fit us. And that means um, that no matter how differently we identify from one another, all of us share what I would call the trans experience of in some ways and at some times not fitting the identities that we're given or the way other people see us. That recognition suggests that instead of thinking of inclusion as a, uh, trying to include people that we don't see as us, we can start from a different baseline. We can see all of our institutions as being made up of people who are different and who are all struggling to one degree or another to make do with the options the institution offers for expressing and having others recognize our sense of who we are. In other words, we approach inclusion from the perspective that the experiences of being different and not fitting in are things that to one degree or another, we all have in common. And I wanted to offer one, uh, pertinent uh, example of this um, because it freaks even me out. I have a little tower of Babel panic when I think about, well, how do you base policy on this idea that everybody is different? And one way to calm ourselves down a little bit is to think about the university. What makes a university a university is the wide range of disciplines and subject matter that it includes. Those disciplines have different languages, different requirements, different even ideas of what truth are, different values, different credentials, but you have a lousy university unless you have a whole bunch of them. And the embracing differences is actually what constitutes the sense of us that the university is. Now, as I know Dana is thinking, that's also a pain to manage and juggle all of those different things, absolutely. But inclusion, like identity, is an ongoing process. It's not a steady state that we're shooting for. If, if I could uh, thank you, by the way, for that both poignant and personal set of uh, remarks. And it was your spectrum is very valuable for thinking about this. I'm going to go completely off script now because I want to respond to your thinking about institutions and higher education in particular, because if you look in the biomedical field as our sense of knowledge, so we had biology, we had chemistry, we had other fields. And as we understood the underlying structure better, we started to create new departments, biochemistry, molecular medicine, and our fields differed. But it's interesting, you know, we still have English, social science, economics, social science, on the social science side and in, in some of the other arts and letters, there hasn't been as much progress. So I think the question is whether, you know, when you talk about the constantly evolving set of terms and there's a desire in public policy to, as you said, enumerate people and have them identify. So I guess the question is, how do we get closer to this biomedical model of culture rather than the, and I don't wanna make fun mm. of my own field, but the social science model, which may, may be studying this, but is not mm. evolved in the way you're talking about. That's a, a great question. And one of the things that I wanna emphasize is that there is no perfection or utopia here, not just because everything human beings do is messed up in some way, though that is certainly true, but also because different institutions are different, just like different people are different. And so different institutions are going to approach questions of inclusion 
in different ways. They need to do that because there are always um, trade-offs, right? As an economist, there are always costs that go along with the benefits. It's You can't do anything where there are only benefits and there are no costs. So when you have a profusion of different identities, different fields and subfields, that is uh, phenomenal in a lot of ways. It's very rich. However, it can also lead to kind of balkanization. It can make it hard for people to understand when they're um, reinventing the same wheels that other people have dealt, right? So there are challenges for that. It makes it hard to build coalitions are harder to manage than single issue groups is another way to think sure. about it in politics. No, and I, I, I think, you know, we like, it's, it's just provocative to think you know, if you established a department of transgender studies, I think your point is you're not solving this problem at all. And, you know. No. And yeah. I, I wanted to say one other thing is once you realize that there is no just solving this problem, there are just different ways to, yeah. to go about it and more or less conscious ways, right? Our institutions are always just going to be filled with people who are different. And the question is, how we what we're offering people in terms of what differences do we recognize? What differences do we not want to recognize? What do we group together? What do we put under a microscope? These are different choices. They have different results. So one good case example is another women's college. So my, my women's college did not respond to my coming out by considering their language of shared identity or what they wanted to do with diversity. No. That, to that tolerating, tolerating is a way of avoiding that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but Smith College did. So Smith College, women's college, lar you know, like all women's colleges, struggles uh, with funding. And, uh, you know, women as alums are not usually deep pocketed. And mm -hmm. so your alums are very important. And those alums are all bound together by the language of binary gender. They went to the college, they identify with the college because they are women as defined by binary gender. So you get uh, students and some alums, but mostly it was students and applicants who are saying, well, we're transgender, we identify as female. I'm a woman as far as myself in terms of my own identification, let me in. Mm -hmm. And then you have students who were admitted because when they had uh, applied, they were living as women, they've been born and raised as women, but now they've come out as uh, transgender men or some other kind of gender identity. And so Smith had to say like, what are we do gonna do with this? Mm -hmm. One response would be to say, well, look, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. We are for people who are women as defined by traditional binary gender. It's not a moral decision, it's a practical decision, right? Just the way we don't admit men, we're not gonna admit people who don't fit this definition. Um, another thing that they could have done was what Mount Holyoke did, which was basically list all of these categories of trans and non-binary relations to identity and finish with saying, but we don't admit anybody who was born, raised and identifies as male, right? So anybody but men. Women now means anybody but men. Smith, though, said uh, women to us means anybody who identifies as female at the time that they apply to the school. Mm -hmm. That's it. No matter what happens to your identity after you're at the school, we continue to include you in the community. How that actually works in terms of inclusion, do they value trans identities? I don't know the details of that, but what is good about the model is it's a very conscious way of thinking about what they will and won't do in terms of inclusion. Sure. And so it does get at this question, which, and I, I really liked your spectrum for thinking about this. How does social policy and public policy put us on that spectrum. So for you can't mandate inclusion, but you certainly can prevent genocide, for example. So we know at the extremes, what, you know, at the bottom of the spectrum, so to speak, and I don't use that pejoratively, but morally, I think we know where we're trying to get to. Uh, you know, the public policy, I would say, would you say you and the, the experience you described kind of 
it kind of puts people in the tolerant world where you're almost requiring tolerance in some sense. But it it's very hard to move us, I, I would think, beyond tolerance to full inclusion by mandating policies. And it really has to be a cultural change. Am that I is a profoundly right true point. That's absolutely true. And one of the, it's one of the paradoxes of civil rights legislation. And I think if you ask a lot of black people in America, they will tell you that this uh, has been proven true. So um, legally you can prevent people from being excluded. You can mandate uh, admission and sort of a kind of a formalized equal treatment but that only gets you as far as tolerance goes. And it doesn't even get you that far because people then can self-segregate in all of these different kinds of ways. It doesn't actually uh, do enough to create real inclusion. That requires more forcible, you know, uh, policies of forced integration actually were, are able to make that kind of progress. Or um, if we desegregated housing, for example, when people live together, a lot of the things that feel like insuperably different identities, we know that they just break down naturally. That's people come up with different languages of identity. Oh, everybody in the neighborhood is everybody in the neighborhood kind of thing. Um, but telling an institution that they have to allow certain people in doesn't actually lead to inclusion. And my heart both soared and sank when um, uh, President Obama's uh, Attorney General um, Loretta Lynch said that um, trans students would have to be admitted everywhere and treated equally. You know, I was delighted, that's great, but I also knew that there would be a backlash because I knew that no groundwork was being laid to renegotiate what gender meant, how we should understand these kids, how their presence affected other people's presence. Everybody has a stake in this. Mm -hmm. And if you do things by fiat, people are gonna get pissed off. It doesn't. Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, you, I have two points about that. First is, you know, you're saying gender is a point in time estimate, not something you're endowed with. And that is a very big change for public policy. Uh, but the other part of it is that I think a lot of people responded in their institutions by saying the right response is to just not discuss these issues and put blinders on because it becomes a legally fraught issue. And if I'm hearing you, you can't get to inclusion by doing that. You need, to, and I thought it was kind of interesting that you said, you know, you were the only one at the university. Well, maybe you were the only one at the university because no one's talking about it. There are probably lots of people. And if you could just find a way to talk about it, that people would be able to share the experience more. That's right. And that is why actually um, small C conservative communities and traditional societies often don't want to allow discussion of different kinds of identities because it is hard for people to figure out who they are if there's no acknowledgement of that. It was hard for me to make sense of who I was as a kid. It was devastating, it's a horrible way to grow up. But it does minimize the, the amount of diversity that you're gonna see in your community if you don't let people even know that those kinds of differences, those ways of being human exist. Yeah. So part of the, the thing that's hard about this is people have to do a lot of talking, uncomfortable talking. You really have to, everybody is a stakeholder, so everybody's got to be heard. Smith had got a lot of angry feedback from alums yep. and current students. And, on, and they certainly heard a lot from trans supportive students. And interestingly enough, it was a huge deal at the time they were making the change and it's not a huge deal anymore. Mm -hmm. It occupied a large part of their public image for a short period of time. Mount Holyoke had an enormous thing on their admissions page. It was like a gender theory explanation of different things. And when I just looked before this talk, it was like they, I couldn't even find any reference to gender diversity. 
It had just, it was so not an issue for them. So the process of figuring this stuff out and people freak out, this is the Tower of Babel moment, right? The moment that people in the Tower of Babel story, they said, oh my God, we don't speak the same language. We're different from each other. If they'd hung in there, they could have figured it out, but instead they freaked out and they went in a bunch of different directions. So Smith and Mount Holyoke, they hung in there through the panic and they came to another communal understanding of what their shared identity and language of identity would be. That's a very helpful lesson, you know, and it, it kind of gets it. I've got four questions from the audience that I think are excellent that I want to get to. And so, the first one is, do you think we're making progress in these areas? I guess the question is, who is we? Yeah. But, but yes, absolutely. You know, my, in terms of human history, my lifetime is not even an eye blink. And I live in a radically transformed world, a world I couldn't imagine when I was growing up and really for most of my adult life. So we are making progress and a lot of the grief that people are feeling and a lot of the anger and fear and backlash. You don't get backlash um, until you have progress. Um, actually, my university didn't even know how to discriminate against trans people. They were all about the homophobia. That was a recognized stigmatized difference, but Orthodox people didn't know how to hate on trans people until I came along and they've made great strides both yeah, but you mean it not in the hating I think you mean <laughs> well both in the hating but oh. also because I was this example I'm not orthodox but I was an example of a, an openly queer person mm -hmm. existing in the orthodox world that did empower a lot of very brave LGBTQ orthodox people who live in the orthodox world to come out and start making progress we need to think of these as, on, as like I say, it's an ongoing process and an ongoing negotiation. And it's not, I, I, there's not one trajectory. We do go backward and forward. And a lot of it has to do with how we manage fear and anxiety. And I just wanna say that this is another reason that I would say, are we making progress? That question often establishes another kind of binary that I think is very unhelpful, which is the people who are all about including me are the good people and the other people are the bad people. Yeah. And that's not helpful. Yeah. We're all folks who have to share this gender thing. Yeah. And we all, if my feelings of self-identification are valid, so are the feelings of somebody who says, wait, you can't be a woman and have me be a woman at the same time. And that position has probably got you into a lot of trouble, I think. Uh, but I, I couldn't agree with you more, by the way, on that. Uh, so I want to, we only have a few minutes left and I, a couple questions have come up. You talked about the fluidity uh, of um, gender identification, self-identification really. Uh, and we do want to enumerate these things. The government does that. How do you do, how do we do this in a way that uh, someone asked respects people's self-identification? Mm. There are, there's a particular example that I think um, is helpful. Somebody was, there are trans activists, I'm not among them, who want to eliminate sex as a marker on birth certificates. And the good reason to do this is we now know that for some percentage of people, sex and gender are not gonna correlate very well, mm -hmm. right? They're gonna, you know, they're gonna have a, be sexually identified one way, but when they, you know, sometime later, they're gonna say, but actually I'm somebody, something other than male or female that's marked down there. Or something other than my genitals would announce me to be. Um, that's a good reason to do that. And so for trans people later in life, those uh, M's and F's create all kinds of problems. But a woman who does research on a feminist scholar who does research on women's economic situations says, well, wait a second, if we stop counting the number of people who are physically female, how the heck are we going to measure all kinds of things like wage discrimination and other things like that? So um, again, we have to figure out how 
there are trade-offs, but what we want to do is, number one, ideally depoliticize this and, and to think of this as shared practical questions. As a citizen, I have an interest in knowing the degree to which misogyny is structuring the economy. That costs everybody. Mm -hmm. Even if it inconveniences me in some ways as a trans person, that doesn't change the fact that I have this other interest. So what we want to do is look for ways of doing this. And depending on what our purpose is, we're going to make different imperfect choices. And, and we need to think carefully about the trade-offs. The problem is the reason the sex of a child is the first thing that people announce, even though some children can't be identified by sex when they're born, is because everything about that baby, literally everything is gonna change over and over again during its lifetime. But we count on its genitalia not to change beyond recognition. In fact, they'll look very different at different times, but we count on them to be recognizable as male or female, no matter how long that child lives. We, it's because everything else is so changing that we hang on to those genitals as identifiers. And I, so I think what I would say is we need to try to unburden some of those identifiers and ask how much we really need, really needs to, you know, for a doctor, my doctors need to know whether I'm physically male or physically female. They also need to know my gender identification. Right. Now that's a Excellent point. And, you know, over time, the metrics that we want to know about people have changed, you know, and race and ethnicity were added as our, as we became more, uh, as our, the U.S. became less Eurocentric and uh, more of an immigrant society. So, uh, I think ordinarily we stop. I'm gonna keep going with a few more questions. I hope you don't mind. I wanna apologize to our audience. I, I never do this, so this- It's my fault, I talk yeah. too long. I'm gonna blame Joy, uh, but you're welcome to leave. And But there are a couple more questions that I think uh, are worth asking. The, one, one of them is, uh, we haven't talked at all about poetry and the role of arts and- mm. One of the things we're grappling with is how, um, a, as a school, is mm -hmm. uh, how the arts can help heal some of the wounds that have been revealed recently mm -hmm. in terms of um, social justice and the like. How do you see the arts playing a role in this, you know, maybe you don't want to call it a cultural transformation, but uh, in making progress in this area. No, absolutely. And I, it is a cultural transformation. It's just not one that has an end. Right. It's a, we're in an ongoing transformation. Yeah. And the arts always has uh, roles in that. Um, one thing that the arts do that's very important and life-saving for a lot of oppressed people, when you're different in ways that are socially stigmatized, one of the things that can keep you going is having artistic means of expressing yourself, your own point of view, your life, because it's the dominant culture that's stigmatizing you usually does not represent things from your point of view. Usually when you look for images of who you are in that culture, they are ugly images, damaging images. So arts can be life-saving ways for people, uh, trans kids, for example, to affirm themselves and express themselves. And also when I uh, wrote I wrote a bunch of poems uh, with the express purpose of creating language for expressing aspects of transgender experience that there wasn't language for. Like there just weren't ways of talking about this. And my hope was, and it, it's, for some people this is, have told me that this is true for them. For some people the, the uh, language I came up with fit really, really well. Whether, they, whether I meant what they meant, that wasn't what I wanted. I didn't want everybody to have my trans experience. I didn't want to be understood. I wanted to give people words that they could use to understand themselves and also to talk to other people. So, you know, with the memoir of gender transition I wrote um, has been given, has been used by people, by communities for book discussions to talk about trans and Jewish identities, how they go together. It's been given by a couples, one member of a couple to another. I've had therapists 
talk about how the insights that it gave them. And that was what I was after. I was hoping that I would be pushing what uh, Virginia Woolf called the light of the, or Forster, Ian Forster called the light of the English language into this darkness because trans experiences are, have been rarely expressed. But the other thing is that once you put something in language or a painting or in music, it doesn't stay put, which is how you get all these rich suburban white kids rapping. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that is the way culture works because powerful works of art are promiscuous. We're all attracted to them. We wanna make them uh, our own. Every culture is an amalgam. There is no pure culture anywhere. Whenever you get into the history of it, it turns out that you're just looking at a moment when different influences have been mixed together in different ways. And so the more art you have by stigmatized groups, the more investment people who don't identify with those groups have in their in those groups in their culture i don't know if there are any americans who wish that there wasn't black music there are americans who wish there weren't black people but there are no americans who wish there wasn't <laughs> black music and so i'm gonna this is the final question but you and you touched on this i think i know how you're gonna answer this but i don't like to predict um there are people who take the view maybe re- for religious reasons or um their belief on morality, who would believe that we should not go too far on the spectrum. We should stay in a binary world. We know how to exist in a binary world, however uncomfortable it is. And they express those opinions. And how do we deal with that? A lot of people have said that, you know, how do we deal with how do we have the right forum as an educational institution for those types of discussions? Mm. That is a crucial point. And one that I thought of, um, I gave a talk about at Mount Holyoke about the politics of gender at women's institutions. And in the process of thinking my way through that, I realized that there's a kind of gender diversity uh, that we don't talk about, but that is crucial, um, which is there are, have always been different kinds of models of gender, different languages of gender. Every family that speaks binary gender has a somewhat different language uh, dialect of it, but there are also cultures that have completely different languages of gender. The world has always been a place where there are different, when I, when I am in New York City, and I cross the threshold into my institution, I walk into a world that has an Orthodox Jewish binary gender language. That's the way they understand it. And I'm bringing in a completely different one. And the the Tower of Babel doesn't fall, the world doesn't end, Orthodox Judaism goes on. So one thing that we need to do is recognize that our goal is not one single progressive idea of gender or conservative idea of gender. In my ideal world, it's kind of like religious pluralism. You know, Jews may continue to think of ourselves as having the best religion and so may Muslims and so may Christians and Hindus and so forth, but uh, we don't have to exterminate people of other religions in order to be who we are. And I don't anticipate that there will be a world where there are no communities that have traditional very conservative languages of binary gender. It's something that has a real appeal to a lot of people and different sort of functionality. And so the goal isn't to eliminate that. The goal is instead to find ways of recognizing the different ways we do gender, realize that they can coexist, sit right next to each other, look for the areas of overlap, negotiate the areas where they're in conflict. And I think that when we do that, we recognize that there are a lot of ways that they don't have to conflict. Well, you know, actually that's a great place to leave the conversation. I think you've summed it up quite well. And I wanna thank you for your time and your willingness to share and for all you're doing. And um, thank you to the audience for their forbearance. I went 10 minutes over, which I don't like to do. So uh, take care everyone. Uh, Thank you again, Joy.